Hi everyone and welcome to today's talk where I'm going to talk to you a bit about clustering and hopefully help you to learn a bit about it. My name is Jamie Kennedy and I'm a final year financial math student in UCD and I'm the machine learning sector lead within Datasoc. So obviously this event is being run by Datasoc and I'd say most of you know this already but Datasoc is Ireland's first student run data science society and our main goal is to bridge the gap between industry and academia by providing students with opportunities to gain experience outside of the classroom, kind of what like we're doing here. So today's talk, we are going to talk a bit about clustering. Uh, clustering is a really popular unsupervised learning technique, and it basically involves discovering natural groups in the data. So unsupervised learning can be really useful as we can learn things about the data without actually needing any like predefined labels on the data. So for example, in this slide here, we have this mixed data and then a clustering algorithm is able to separate this data into the different groups of similar items. So you can see here, there's like the baseballs, the footballs and the basketballs. And so clustering can be a really useful tool and it goes hand in hand with data preparation. A lot of the time you'll have to work with unstructured data and clustering can be a way to perform some surface level analysis. So for example, marketers can perform a clustering analysis to quickly segment customer demographics, as we see here. So we're looking at how price sensitive the customer is compared to how brand loyal they are. And we can see there are some clear clusters here. So for example, in the red cluster, um, these people are very loyal to a brand and so are willing to pay a bit more for that brand. And so analysis like this can help marketers determine what sort of customers they have and who should they should be targeting. Um, so there are lots of different types of clustering and the main three types are probably partitional methods, hierarchical clustering, and recently model-based model -based clustering has become an active area of research. Um, so hierarchical clustering creates a hierarchy of clusters, as we can see here. It uh, builds the hierarchy from the individual elements by progressively merging clusters. So you can see the way it adds like B and C to form BC and then merges this with D, E and F to form an even bigger cluster and so on like that. Um, but today we're going to focus on partitional clustering and in particular a certain type of partitional clustering called k-means clustering. So in this type of clustering, the algorithm divides the data into k disjoint groups, as we can see in the image here. The algorithm depends on two main parameters, which are the number of clusters and then the cluster centroids. So the number here, the number of clusters is clearly three, and the cluster centroids are the three black dots you see in between the colored dots. So I'm just gonna show you a quick YouTube video to help you understand how the algorithm works. So I'll just stop, stop sharing here for a sec. And I'll share a YouTube video. So I'll just play this. So you see at the start here, you have all your data kind of running around the place and then we're gonna want four clusters. So we just randomly decide where our four cluster centroids will be at the start. So you see the, the different color squares here. And then as this goes on, the algorithm starts to assign um, all the data points to the nearest cluster. And then as you can see there, once it assigns the data points to the nearest cluster, it then moves the clusters to be at the center of that new cluster and then it kind of just keeps redoing the same thing until you get your kind of four clear clusters so i'll just let it run here just so you can see how it keeps going so hopefully that kind of helped see a bit about what's going on in the algorithm and i'll just jump back to the slides now
So just before we move to OR to do the actual project, I just want to show a little bit about how we choose how many clusters to use. So the first thing we look at is the kalinsky harbaz index. Um, so we want a high value of this index, and we can check this by computing the index for different values of k, and then seeing which is the highest. I'm not going to go too much into details about how this is calculated, because there's a bit in it. But if anyone wants to know more, I can like provide some resources after the talk or anything about that. And then we're also going to look at the silhouette plot for various clusters. So we want clusters that are quite different to the other clusters, but that have the, um, the data points within that cluster are similar to each other. Um, and we also want, so we want the clusters far away from each other. So as you can see here, the blue cluster is quite far away from the other clusters. And this is kind of reflected in the silhouette plot on the left-hand side, which shows a higher silhouette value for the blue cluster. And I'll just pause here if anyone has any questions so far um, about what we've covered. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it. So I'll just keep going. Or was there one there? All good so far, nice. Um, so just before hopping over, I want to show how Spotify could use clustering. So they can kind of cluster your songs into different groups, and then they can find songs with sort of similar audio features to the ones you liked. So for example, on the right here, this person, they could cluster this person's songs and see that they're into this sort of indie rock sort of music. And then they can recommend more songs with sort of that are similar to that with similar audio features. So that gives a bit of an idea of why we're doing this. And I'm just going to hop over to R so we can actually do it ourselves. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so the first thing we're going to want to do is just set our working directory. So um, or knows where to find the data. So that's pretty easy to do. You just go up here, set working directory, and I saved the data file in datasock folder. So I just set that. I'll send around the data and the code after this talk, um, so you can all reproduce this if you want it. And then, so we just want to look a bit at, oh, I load, loaded in, I forgot to load it in. So run that line of code to load in the data. And then we just want to look at it a bit to see what the data looks like. So if we run this, then we see we have these different variables down here. So you have like the title of the shot, the song, the artist, the genre, and the different audio features. So then, um, so now we want to just save the um, the genre variable because we're going to use this for external validation at the end. So we just saved that. And now um, to do the actual clustering, we just want the, the variables that are the actual audio features. So we'll just remove a couple of the other variables that aren't audio features, um, like title, artist, genre, things like that. So we do that by running that line of code. And now we want to scale our data, but because we want um, it all to sort of be proportional to each other. But to scale data, we need it to be um, numerical. So again, we just want to check the variables here to see are they numerical. And if we look at the output down here, we see that length duration is actually not. So we're going to want to change that to numerical data. And just when we're doing this, we have to be careful because the way this data is recorded is it has a comma in it. So if you see here, it's one comma, one, two, one, instead of just 1121. So when we're changing it to numeric, if we don't use this G sub function here, then it will turn it will return that data as NA. So just be careful of that. So I'll just run that. And now we look at our data again, and it is scaled, as you can see here. Um, so now, if you remember about the kalinsky harbaz index, that is what we want to do next. So we're just going to run this, and we can look, calculate that index for different values of K and we'll plot the output as well. So we still get it here now. And as you can see, um, 
the highest value of k is for two clusters, and then it's also quite high for three clusters. So we're going to kind of look at both of them before we decide which one to actually use. So we fit the two clusters, we fit the three clusters, and now we're going to sort of look at some plots there. I think we just got a message there, really. Um, yeah, sure. So basically, we don't know sort of how the values of the data are recorded. So like one value could be like one, two, three, and then another variable could be in terms of hundreds or thousands and stuff like that. Um, so basically we scale the data to get it all to be between zero and one. And then now um, they're all sort of proportional to each other because otherwise the higher values that are in terms of like hundreds of thousands will take over if you don't scale them, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm just going to look at the plots of the, the different um, clusters here. So we do two clusters. And if we zoom in here, you see how there's pretty clearly two different clusters in the data, like the, the blue one and the orange one here. And then if we look at the three clusters, we basically see that adding this um, extra cluster, if that, if that works, or well, the zoom's not really working, but you, you can see here, if you add the extra cluster, the pink cluster, it doesn't really do anything for us because there's no real extra cluster. It kind of just splits around between the other clusters. So we're sort of thinking that three clusters isn't going to be good, which kind of confirms what we saw with the CH index. But now we're just going to look at the silhouette plots just to kind of confirm that. So if we run this code, then we look at the silhouette plot for two values. And right, so it has an average silhouette width of 0 0.33 down here. And then if we run it for three, we see the average silhouette width is 0 0.25. So again, two clusters has a higher silhouette value. So it confirms that we should be going with two clusters. So now, since we have our clustering done with two clusters, we're just going to compare how this relates to the genres that we saved at the start. So we can get a table of the clusters against the genres. And what we basically see here is that cluster one is evenly split between um, alt rock and dance pop, and cluster two is mainly adult standards. So what it kind of tells is, um, adult standards is quite different to the other ones, but alt rock and dance pop, they probably have pretty similar um, audio features and aren't actually that different. Um, I'll just look at, I think there's another chat message here. Is the silhouette essentially a measure of how accurate the clusters are? Um, it's not really a measure of how accurate the clusters are. What it basically does is it looks at the distance between the points in the cluster itself, and then also um, the distance between one cluster and another cluster. And it can use these values to sort of tell us how sort of distinct these clusters are and how different they are from the other clusters, um, if that kind of helps your question. And besides that, um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. So I'd welcome some more questions. And um, if not, you're all. Free to go. I'll just stop sharing now. And I think there's another chat message here. Um, cool sound. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, if there's no more questions, um, everyone, you can you're free to go. Thanks for coming. And as I said earlier, actually, um, I can send around all this stuff as well. So you'll probably get that later this evening or tomorrow. Just a question there from Adam. What other applications of clustering is there in industry? Um, tons. Clustering is kind of used um, all over the place. It really, it's really good for, like, as I said, when there's unstructured data 
or when you're just trying to co sort of um, find things in data. So for example, I know PayPal, if you know PayPal, they have a big problem with um, sort of fraudulent payments and stuff. So they, they, a method they use for clustering is they sort of cluster all the payments and then they can, this allows them to sort, see sort of anomaly, anomaly payments, which are different to all the other payments. And then they'll, they'll then, we'll be able to see that these are fraudulent and then use this to train supervised models to look for, out for things like this in the future. So that's just another application.